four candidate interviews for uh, an open position in the, school, in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences for the Transgender Studies Cluster Hire. There's another search going on in the Gender and Women's Studies uh, Department, uh, but this is a, a search involving the Anthropology Department, the History Department, Judaic Studies, and Latin American Studies. It's unclear where the successful candidate will wind up. Uh, today's presentation will be by, uh, by Eric Clemens, so he'll be introduced in, in just a moment. Uh, one, one quick announcement, if you're here for GWS 260 uh, and you want to sign in, there'll be a, the sign-in sheet will be back by the back door here. I can pass it around, or okay, should we, we just... Pa pass it around. If you're not in GWS, don't sign the attendance sheet, okay? <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, with no further ado, I will now introduce Diane, who's going to introduce Eric. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It is wonderful to have everybody here today. I'm Diane Austin, the director of the School of Anthropology. It is my great pleasure to introduce Eric Clemens, who will be our presenter today. Eric received his BA in History from DePaul University, his Master's in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago, and his PhD from, in Anthropology from UC Berkeley. And he's published in, in several prominent places, including the Journal of Medical Humanities and the Body Reader, Essential Social and Cultural Readings. He currently holds a postdoc fellowship with the Michigan Society's Society of Fellows and is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's received numerous awards, including the Kenneth W. Payne Prize from the Association for Queer Anthropology of the American Anthropological Association. He's already established himself as a serious scholar in the field of transgender studies. Uh, a couple of examples, in 2013, he was an invited, invited participant in the, uh, a, a, excuse me, the Association for Queer Anthropology Roundtable at the American Anthropology, uh, Anthropological Association meetings. In 2012, he organized an event, Transformation, Ethics, and Politics of Trans Medicine and Healthcare at UC Berkeley. So it gives you a little idea of the breadth and the kinds of work that he's been doing, and it is my great pleasure to go ahead and turn it over to Eric. As you can see today, his <coughs> presentation, The Look of a Woman, Facial Feminization Surgery and the Making of Gender. So Eric, thank you. surgery not as a concept or as a symbol, but as a practice, enacted by individual surgeons and individual patients situated in time and place. What I'll argue today is that the practice of facial feminization surgery, like all forms of surgical sex reassignment, materializes into action and incites into speech contested forms of knowledge about what it means to be sexed, to be gendered, and to be transgendered. I'll make this argument by describing my field research with two of the six U.S. surgeons who specialize in this growing contemporary practice in the United States. Um, reorienting the project of surgical sex reassignment from the genitals to the face, the practice of facial feminization surgery opens questions about how to read the body as a material limit to gender and how to think about the status of surgical practice aimed at changing that limit. At its most basic, the gist of surgical sex reassignment is pretty easy to understand. Through a variety of interventions, male bodies are reduction into female bodies, or female bodies into male lost bodies. But moving past this very general explanation to begin asking about the nature of those interventions themselves opens this seemingly straightforward process to a number of questions. Right? What kind of thing or things is sex as a set of bodily properties in which surgery can intervene? How is knowledge about the specialized techniques 
um, involved in sex reassignment circulated and created, to which surgeons, for which patients, under what kinds of therapeutic logics. There's no consensus, surgical or otherwise, as to how sex is constituted, thus how and into what sex might be changed are much more open questions than a story of simply swapping opposite anatomical structures which might have it. My ethnographic work with surgeons who specialize in sex reassignment is oriented by a claim that Marcel Mose made in his Manual of Ethnography. In order to understand how people think about and make sense of something, Mose argued, you have to pay attention to what they do in their, with their hands in relation to that thing. In close and careful attention to techniques, which Mose defined as actions combined in order to produce an effect, we can see much more than the simple actions themselves. Technique, techniques manifest forms of meaning and of value that exceed the motions by which they are constituted. They open onto the world. Sex reassignment surgery in a variety of forms and by a variety of names is being performed in the United States and in many countries around the world every day. But our knowledge about what's actually taking place in operating rooms is hardly more nuanced than that statement that I just made. I take this as an object of what Mayor High and Kelly have recently termed in their book of the same name, an anthropology of ignorance. At stake is not simply that we don't know what's happening in the OR in the name of sex reassignment, or sometimes gender reassignment, or sometimes gender, gender confirmation, or sometimes gender affirmation, as well, and of terms with contested histories and interesting politics. So at, at, at stake is not that we don't know what's happening, but that there are a variety of dynamics in place that make specific about, specifics about transurgical techniques hard to know. These have to do, as I'll explain today, with market forces, with contested therapeutic logics, with the individual styles that characterize surgery as at once an art and a science, and with the inherent instability of the intended goal, or as most called it, the effect of the procedures themselves. Woman, man, male, female, masculine, feminine, are shifting terms whose relationship to anatomy, like the bodily material of the surgical technique, is always in negotiation. Politically, too, trans surgery is a hard thing to talk about. Because trans surgery has been controversial, overtly politicized, and criticized, because it captures the attention of gawkers and the imaginations of those for whom the idea of cutting into genitals is both too lurid and too titillating to resist, there are really good reasons to refuse the topic of trans surgery altogether, which is a point that Booker Cox recently made to Katie Couric to much social media acclaim. So for those of you whose Facebook feeds were not totally full of this and the email boxes were totally full of this, the brief version is that Laverne Cox, who's this woman here, who's a trans woman and also plays a trans woman in the Orange is the New Black series, um, was a guest on Katie Couric's daytime talk show. I think Katie was super interested in genital forms and surgery and all of this. And Cox's reply was, when we focus all our time talking about surgery and on bodies, we don't get to talk about other things that are really important, like the fact that trans women, especially trans women of color, are disproportionately victimized by violence, are disproportionately homeless, are disproportionately um, affected by HIV and other kinds of health disparities. And so she said, let's not talk about bodies, Katie. <laughs> it was great, it was super, it very well articulated and right to the point and, and people heard it. Um, but refusals to talk about surgery, while indisputably supporting one kind of good, have the unintended effects as well. Our ignorance of into what and through which means surgeons are altering bodies in the name of trans medical care is not only a problem for the medical anthropologist, it's a problem for the trans person seeking surgery who has to navigate ad hoc and incomplete resources to make choices about the surgical future. It's a problem for doctors as they look for and try new techniques, and it's certainly a problem for people whose bodies have already been subject to these kinds of negotiations. So attending to surgical technique, a term that I mean to encompass both ways of knowing bodies and ways of making them, allows us to register contested social and conceptual objects ethnographically. And that in my work is what I try to do. So, with this framework in mind, let me turn to my uh, ethnographic work on facial feminization surgery. In order to change sex through surgery, you first have to make it something that surgery can change. For many decades, these efforts focused on the genitals as a site of a body's maleness or femaleness. But in the mid 1980s, a novel set of techniques was developed in order to change a part of the body that proponents claim plays a more central role in the assessment and attribution of sex in everyday life, face. So facial feminization surgery, FFS, is a set of bone and soft tissue reconstructive procedures intended to feminize the faces of trans women. It was this procedure that Rachel had undergone. When I first met Rachel, five days after her surgery, I had to stifle a sympathetic wince. 
Her eyes were ringed in deep browns and purples, and the black sutures tacked back and forth across the thin red incision line that traced along just beneath her nose. Though the packing had been removed from her nostrils earlier in the day, the cast on her nose remained and was held placed by a large X of tape rising up above her eyebrows and down across her cheeks. Her thinning hair and receding temporal baldness left sutures and staples visible across the crown of her head. Her lower face was puffed and bruised, and since swallowing was painful, she dabbed saliva from the corners of her mouth uh, with a white cotton handkerchief. I felt sore for her, like neither of us should move too quickly. She, on the other hand, said she was feeling better than she had in days, and was light on her feet as she led me to the back garden where we could talk. Rachel, a transsexual woman now in her mid-50s, had first decided that she wanted facial feminization surgery 15 years earlier, as soon as she saw before and after photographs posted online. She said, from the moment I knew it existed, I thought, wow. I knew I didn't have a pretty face. I'd get dressed up, but I knew I didn't look like a woman. I could put all the makeup in the world on, and nobody was going to mistake me for a girl, maybe when I was like 16. When I asked her what it was about her face that she had wanted to change, she had trouble locating the problem that she hoped surgery could fix, though she could quickly recount the list of procedures that had just been performed. She had had her forehead bone set back, her hairline reshaped and moved forward, her nose reduced at the bridge and raised at the tip, her jaw made more narrow in the back and uh, shorter and more pointed at the chin, and her thyroid cartilage, or Adam's apple, had been removed. In addition, her upper lip had been shortened and blocked. She said, my goal, my ideal, is that I could go out on the street dressed like I'm dressed right now, just a pair of pants and a t-shirt and some sneakers, and no gender markings other than I'd be wearing <coughs> earrings, which I always wear. And then I went, when I went into the grocery store, the person would say, can I help you, miss? That's what I want. I want to be read as, accepted as, and reacted to as a woman. So that's what I was hoping he would say he can do. And that's what he does say he can do. That is what he promises. Rachel's new face, still tender, bruised, and cut, held under its bandages the promise of a radically new identity made possible in large part through a particular form of surgical intervention performed by a particular surgeon. In her grocery store fantasy, it's Rachel's face alone, unadorned by carefully crafted hairdos, makeup, and jewelry, that anchors a femininity so fundamental that a banal scene that may have before instigated a tense social exchange of shifty looks and bumbled pronouns becomes an opportunity for genteel deference. Can I help you, miss? In this moment, Rachel would get what she wanted, to be read as, accepted as, and reacted to as a woman. So if this is the problem, the promise of FFS, as an ethnographer, I wanted to know, what does a woman look like? What kinds of knowledge can be used to support a claim to know? These questions are, of course, inseparable, as techniques used to address a given problem depend on how the problem is constituted. If, returning to Moses' terms, the desired effect of FFS is femininity, then surgeons must begin by defining their terms and deciding what it means as a problem of practice to intervene one cut one saw stroke, one suture at a time, to make a patient look like a woman. So my talk today is based on a year of ethnographic fieldwork in the offices and operating rooms of two FFS specialists, and I will proceed in four parts. First, I'll describe the work of Dr. Douglas Osterhout, the craniomaxillofacial surgeon who first developed FFS in the mid-1980s. Osterhout is a science and numbers guy. For him, feminizing patients' faces is about producing femaleness a category he understands as an objective certainty. Next, I'll describe the work of Dr. Joel Beck, a plastic surgeon who got into FFS about seven years ago. During the time of my research between 2010 and 2011, he was actively working to grow his specialty in trans surgery. For Beck, woman is a mostly aesthetic category, and women, all women, want to be beautiful. Next, I'll share one patient's story of how a woman as a category is understood after surgery, and I'll close with a brief description of some of my ongoing research with facial and genital surgeons here in the US and abroad. What I'll show today is that the effect of feminization that animates facial feminization surgery sometimes refers to the production of biological femaleness through discourses of scientific difference, and other times to the production of desirable beauty through discourses of aesthetic distinction. Techniques of knowing are, of course, inseparable from those of making. I argue that at stake in these shifting understandings and techniques of feminization is the definition of woman itself, the ostensibly shared category that animates patients' desires and surgeons' technical goals. <coughs> surgeons' power is derived in large part 
from their ability and willingness to stand in for the everyone and imagine the pro so, um, sorry, projected futures of what must be changed in the patient's face in order for everyone to see her as a woman after surgery. And patients negotiate these divergent forms of expertise with their own ideas of what kinds of transformation surgery can have on their lives and how and by whom it can best be achieved. Telling this story requires an engagement with surgical practitioners that is as attentive and generous to them as to the patients they treat. To say that the relationship between trans folks and the surgeons who specialize in their care is complicated would be an understatement. To some, these surgeons are heroes or godlike saviors who, through acts of extraordinary generosity of spirit and deed, have devoted their own lives to making their patients' lives better. They are friends of the community, as I'm often. To others, these same doctors are greedy opportunists, amassing significant personal wealth through largely cash-based market of trans surgery in the United States. Advocates of FFS argue that because it alters the face, the part of the body with which our social and individual identities are most closely linked, the change of sex that it enables is as therapeutic, if not more therapeutic, than the general surgeries, whose status as medically necessary is consistently stressed by those who seek to expand and improve healthcare for trans folks. And at the same time, because it's an intervention explicitly oriented to the responses of others, right? Rachel's moment was when somebody else called her woman. FFS also catalyzes long-standing debates about the ethical and political status of passing this project. Critics argue that efforts made to pass effectively undo a liberatory politics premised on making space for difference through rendering difference visible. All the more so when the means of passing incorporate a surgery that costs tens of thousands of dollars, putting it out of the reach of all but the most resourced communities. As a medical anthropologist, my job is to sit within these dynamics, to see patients, surgeons, and their critics as differently interested actors with distinct forms of knowledge, experience, and personal commitments toward first understanding and then enacting woman. The desires and decisions of those whose understanding of woman involves the surgical unfold within a very particular US market, hemmed in by a contested diagnosis, embattled understandings of how facial surgery constitutes a therapeutic intervention for a kind of dysphoric embodiment that's long been imagined as a personal and genital problem rather than a social and facial one, and a history of trans medical care haunted by suspicion and intentional deception on both the parts of surgeons and patients. To not talk about surgery would be to ignore the complexity and profound vulnerability enacted in the surgical clinic every day, and to render invisible the historical and ongoing links between patients, surgeons, and institutions of knowledge and power that make forms of gendered embodiment possible. So we'll start with Mr. Howard. Rachel's surgeon, Betty, <coughs> whose promise made her look optimistically at her bruised and sutured face, is Dr. Douglas Osterhout. Osterhout, a San Francisco-based cranial maxillofacial surgeon, so that means he works on the jaw, the upper face, and the whole cranium. Um, developed FFS in the early 1980s, just as trans healthcare was leaving university-based centers and emerging as a market-based resource. By the mid-1990s, FFS constituted roughly 80% of his thriving practice. Today, he's performed nearly 1,700 FFS operations, far and away the most of any surgeon in the world. While American trans women often uh, travel un to undergo genital surgeries in other countries, Osterhout draws patients from around the world. His patients are people of means. They either had their own money to spend or access to the social capital to acquire money via loan or credit. When I met Osterhout for the first time, he explained FFS as a procedure whose necessity is both commonsensical and self-evident. This explanation was delivered in part through the use of a Bloom County comic depicting three cartoon characters pulling out the waist of their underwear and looking down at their cartoon genitalia. He slid the image across his desk with a wide grin on his face. You don't walk down the street looking at everyone's pants before you decide what gender they are, he said. You look at their face. In Dr. O's practice, FFS is guided by what he asserts as a scientifically derived numerical difference between male and female faces. He developed these numbers in 1982 after a trans woman named Candace approached him with the request that he feminize her face. At the time, Osterhout wasn't sure how he could do such a thing because at that point, as a surgical category, the female face didn't exist. Here I'd been doing surgery at a major research hospital for several years, Osterhout explained, and I'd never thought about the differences between a boy's and a girl's skull. As a reconstructive surgeon, his work had been organized by the director to make pathologically abnormal skulls and faces into normal ones. 
constituted by its corrective contrast to the often devastating injuries and deformities that his surgical interventions were meant to correct, normal had never been a sex or a gender category. Finding no help from medical sources for which a wide range of anatomical variation can fall into the category of the normal, Osterhout turned to a tradition of scholarship that had long been interested in skulls and what their sizes and shapes could tell us about human difference, physical anthropology. More particularly, he looked to literature on sex differences of the skull from the early 20th century, a time before the ascendance of statistical assessments, when assignments of sex depended almost exclusively on a way, the way that a skull looked to the researcher who was studying it. And here I've um, made a visual rendering of the kinds of evidence that Osterhout was looking at. And this is a, an index of sex differences as described by Alistair Glischka, who's the, sort of the father of American physical anthropology. And in it, in the, the areas I've rendered in blue, are the ones that we can see uh, that he's named, are the sites in a skull that physical anthropologists looked to in order to understand uh, where sex might be uh, made visible, sex differences might be made visible. Now, Osterhout didn't need all of these. He didn't need all of these sites for two reasons. First of all, you can't change everything. So there are physical limitations on what a surgeon can do that can actually be helpful to a patient. Um, and second of all, he was mostly interested in things people could see. So it was part of the, your body that people could see. So there's no point in changing the face of your skull, right? So he turned his attention to things he could see. So the places in pink are things that, for example, show up in Verglischka's index that Osterhout adopted as sites of intervention. Um, but there are also the sites in red that were not really a part of Verglischka's story and that moment in physical anthropology's story that Osterhout then developed. And I'll talk a little bit about why that, that the particular set of things changed mm -hmm. in just a moment. So to these sort of generalized sites of sexual distinction that he found in this literature, he added the specific measurements taken from a longitudinal study on craniofacial growth performed in the orthodontics department at the University of Michigan from the mid-1930s to the mid-1970s. One of a wave of studies prompted by the Hoover administration's call to increase research on normal children, right? not just delinquents, yet to study the normals. The University School Growth Study, or USGS, was designed to form a, form a baseline understanding of how faces grow from <coughs> childhood to adulthood. Basically, the orthodontic interest is knowing when to put braces on. Right? So when are bones going to stop growing? So this is what the, the study was made for, but it's had this other uh, life. So the atlas that resulted from this study was an obvious resource to Osterhout since he worked on the project uh, when he was a graduate student in the dental, dental school at Michigan. From the combination of these two forms of knowledge, the generality of early 20th century physical anthropology and the specificity of the USGS atlas, a product that Osterhout names and consistently describes as scientific and mathematic, the contingent and context-dependent category, woman, became a set of standard measurements. Based on a distinctly Northern European definition of masculinity, the feminization in Osterhout's practice of facial feminization surgery involves transforming racialized and gendered descriptions of sex difference into surgical prescriptions for sex change. The numbers that define the female face don't simply guide Osterhout's surgical plan. They are prescriptive. They are the metrics of facial sex change. The atlas in which the Michigan numbers are presented sat on or near his desk during every day of my fieldwork in his office. Neon pink post-it notes had marked particular pages of the text for so long that their crumpled and exposed edges had faded let me give you a sense of what's in this book. So the, this is a page from the book, and in this particular case, what they're doing is measuring the distance between two variables, so the bottom point of your chin to the anterior nasal spines is inside the nasal complex. Um, and I'm gonna make these numbers bigger. Um, so, so what's being shown is um, the population was six to 16, is kids from first grade through 12th grade, um, and they're listed um, by male and female categories. Again, with no real sense of why that's the case, um, except that there was a claim that there would be more between group difference than in group difference. But they've never calculated in group difference uh, of sexes in this study, so it doesn't matter. Um, and what you're seeing is as the patients get older, what these means and standard deviations for the number of that particular variable look like. And down at the bottom, then these, except these numbers are rendered graphically into the form. But what was most interesting to Osterhout were the extreme ends of this, because what he wanted to see was not that little boys and little girls are indistinguishable, but that as they get older, males and females are distinguishable. And so he looked at the, this part of the, the graph becomes the most important to him. It's worth naming that this ends up being nine girls that form the female mean of what um, femaleness looks like, and they're all white. Ann Arbor, Larson, Germany, 
population in Ann Arbor. Um, and that 16 year old becomes the oldest uh, metric that he has, so that becomes the moment, right? And we can think of all the sorts of ways that surgical interventions to produce feminine looks at 16 as its best moment, right? That's one of all the best. <laughs> So before beginning an operation, um, Osterhout positions the uh, patient's lateral and anterior cephalogram on the light board. Cephalogram is an x-ray of the side of your head, and that's what this is. So this is not an actual patient cephalogram, but these are the numbers from an actual patient exam. So in the negative space of the cephalogram would be a post-it note that would have three sets of numbers. So the first is the set, the current measurement that's taken by using a ruler and measuring the patient's face and flesh and blood, and then measuring the cephalogram, which is a standardized image across world is always the same. So in this case, what we're seeing, what's being measured is the distance between the foremost prominence of Tracy's cornea, so as far as your eyeball goes, in relation to the foremost prominence of her forehead. And the cornea becomes a really useful resource here because while he's redoing bony structures all around, the eyeball stays put. So it becomes a spatial anchor. Right? It, it tells us relational differences. Um, and so what we learn is that in Tracy's case, the foremost prominence of her cornea versus foremost prominence of her forehead bone, the part that you can touch, is 15 millimeters. Um, the USGS Atlas uh, gives us the female mean for this number is seven, okay? And so the third number, of course, is the goal. How do you then reduce Tracy's forehead eight millimeters to get it to the mean? In this case, um, so that you've got two forehead bones, one that holds your brain and one that you can ponk on your, on your head. And the black space in between is a sinus. Most all of us have that. And generally speaking, they're empty if all, is, all goes well. Um, so Osterhout's practice is to take a saw and cut off that front bone and move it back into the sinus space. As long as it's empty, there's no anatomical um, problem uh, with doing that. Um, so he developed this set of typologies for reducing the forehead based on these numbers. So these, this number comes from the book, but he doesn't have to look in the book. He's known this number for a very long time. And I watched many times throughout um, patient exams where he would just simply rattle off numbers based on other kinds of sorts of ratios, what kind of number is the applicable one in any particular uh, patient's exam. So for him, once these particular uh, numbers, uh, dimensions, are instantiated in a patient's face, she is, according to him, indisputably female and will be recognized by others to be so. For him, Rachel's fantasy of being called Miss at the grocery store was virtually guaranteed. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you all the procedures that's involved in what's called a full face FFS. And I'm going to narrate these to you the way that surgeons narrate them, the way that patients often reproduce that surgical narrative, and the way that it shows up in surgical literature. So I'm going to describe it to you as though there are two kinds of faces in the world, male kinds and female kinds. This is not my position. However, I'm going to narrate it to you in this case uh, to make it easier. All right. So. Males have more prominent uh, brow than females do. This accounts for the aggressive forehead, the Neanderthal forehead. Um, that this is caused both by the depth of the sinus that I showed you just a second ago, and by thickness of, of bossing of, of the eyebrows. And you can get rid of this by sawing off that front bone, or uh, according to some surgeons, by using a bird tool, it's just the same you would use in your wood shop, to grind down the bone to make it thinner. Um, if you change the forehead, you have to also articulate the way that the nasal bone art articulates to the forehead. Otherwise, you get left, as Osterhout likes to say, looking like Dick Tracy with the shelf of the nose. So that's why the nasal bone becomes a main site of FFS that it wasn't in her delicious slide, as I showed you before. But it becomes a necessary part of, of FFS. And almost all of these procedures, as you'll hear me describe, are about reduction, right? So it's always making smaller. Um, so the nasal bridge can be made straighter and smaller. Um, males have a more acute angle at the back of their jaw that also has a more wide flare that accounts for the square face. You can reduce that angle to make it softer and you can burr in or cut out bone in order to make the, the, the jaw less wide at the back. Males also have a square and blocky chin. Um, you can reduce this by um, reducing the contour of this bone here and you can reduce the height of the chin by excising uh, a section of bone, uh, this part in orange, and plating and screwing the two uh, pieces back together. Um, the cheeks are a relative part of the body. Women, females, have a round and soft heart-shaped face. And in order to produce that effect, if you don't have cheeks, if you think you don't have uh, full cheeks, that might be because you have a big chin and a big forehead. And if we reduce the chin and forehead, the cheeks may seem more prominent. And if they don't, you can add a cheek. Um, the soft tissue procedures are absolutely um, a part of this story, but the FFS discourse says 
that the architecture of facial sex difference is a, is a bone issue. And that if you do um, soft tissue procedures without doing the bone procedures, you end up, as one patient described to me, looking like a man with a facelift. So if you want that difference, you have to do the bone work. And this is where that fallback to physical anthropology comes all the time. Um, and you'll see in lots of uh, surgical journals, without using any citations, I'll say there are anthropological differences between males and females, and that stands as a sort of generalized term, no real description at all. Um, so the soft tissue procedures. Um, all the stuff that's in pink gets done through one incision. That's when I was describing earlier about Rachel across the crown of her head. Um, so uh, the scalp can be brought forward on the head. If you ever see people that have like really wrinkly in back here, it's, that's a lot of scalp that's available to be brought forward on the head. Um, <laughs> women have uh, a rounded hairline. Men have this that I have from testosterone. It gives me an M-shaped, manly hairline. Um, uh, and, but it can be made rounded if it's brought forward, uh, which can be a, um, a way of dealing, at least momentarily, with balding uh, for some people. Uh, you can't wholly solve that problem, uh, depending on who it is. Um, women's eyebrows are also higher up on their foreheads, which give them a more open and um, friendly look. Yeah, so um, the eyebrows can be brought more high on the forehead, and that also the effect of that is also more dramatic when the bossing beneath it has been removed. So when that thickness of the bone is removed, the, the eyebrows can go higher up on the head. And then the added bonus, of course, is that the crow's feet are reduced with that. Well. Um, women have a more narrow and upturned tip of their nose than men do. Um, Women also have a shorter lip than men do. When a man speaks, you should not see his teeth unless he smiles at you. Um, so in order to produce one to two millimeters of tooth show, uh, this section underneath the nose can be removed and the lip can be raised higher. Um, the only exception to everything gets smaller story here is the lips, which women have full uh, lips with lots of pink showing. Um, men have flat lips. So the lips can be plumped in a variety of different ways. Um, and then the Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage can be removed. So all of these things can be thought of as the full face of an FFS operation. There are some uh, patients who choose to undergo all these at the same time. That will put you on the, on the table for about 11 hours. Um, but certainly um, people uh, have different relationships to how many they want to do at any given time. Now, this suite of procedures is not one that every single surgeon performs. And as I'll uh, tell you in just a second, Disagreement about when and how to apply certain ones of these procedures distinguish surgeons from each other, right? So one person will say, I'm a cheek implant person, and the other person will say, no, 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 no. And I can talk to you about why those, some of those disagreements come up. Just a moment. Dr. Beck. Dr. Beck hosted a cocktail party to welcome a prominent genital sex reassignment surgeon to his practice. A DJ played club music from a small table in the corner of the white marble foyer of Beck's building as guests huddled near tall cocktail tables and watched the door for new arrivals. With the addition of this surgeon and the recently acquired services of an endocrinologist and affiliated esthetician, Beck was well on his way to establishing the hub of transgender medicine that he'd been envisioning. Caitlin and I stood talking as we worked our way through hors d'oeuvres and plastic cups of Cabernet. She had undergone FFS with Beck five years earlier, and she was there both to support him and to get a peek at this new surgeon. <coughs> a few minutes into our conversation, Brooke joined the circle, and the conversation shifted to surgeons. Beck and Osterhout were the only names mentioned. Ten years before, Caitlin had had a consultation with Osterhout, but decided she wasn't ready for FFS back then. Though she'd acknowledged his role as the pioneer in the field, Caitlin didn't like Osterhout's approach. And though she'd never met him, Brooke didn't like him either. Both Caitlin and Brooke found Osterhout's approach too invasive. I'm not letting anyone take a buzzsaw to my face, Brooke put it out. To her, the mere suggestion of such a thing is laughable. According to them, Osterhout's aggressive and standard approach produces a kind of standardized and recognizable result that they called cookie-cutter faces. The cookie-cutter effect was so evident, they said, that it wasn't only visible to in-group trans women in the know. I have straight friends in the East Bay who can spot one of his faces from across the street, right? You hear him say, that's the suburbs. Um, so straight people in the suburbs can't even see it. There was that measure, right? Um, Brooke agreed. She said, it was fine when there were just a few of us, but now that he's done like 15,000 people, which is not the case, but 15,000 people, you'd be walking down the street and see someone who looks like you and say, hey, are you my cousin? 
put off by the very numbers that Osterhout offers to distinguish and defend his approach from criticisms that often plague cosmetic surgeons like Joel Beck, that the work they do is purely subjective, a, reflex a reflection of shifting social norms and their own aesthetic tastes. In choosing Beck, Caitlin and Brooke had chosen a different understanding of woman. I first met Beck at a small conference for trans women and cross-dressers. As he prepared to give his presentation entitled Aesthetic Subtlety with Feminization Surgery, his assistant, Hannah, positioned an enormous bouquet of flowers near her spread of brochures and butterfly-cut sugar cookies frosted and sprinkled in purples and pinks. And this is the, the kind of thing, um, and you'll see, like, and I was talking to you before about this like really particular version of, of femininity that comes in purple and pink and is equivalent almost always with flowers or butterflies or other sorts of things with really intense um, gender images. Jennifer Aniston has an enlarged lower face and a strong chin, Beck said. When it's, when if Paltrow's forehead is enlarged. Angelina Jolie has an enlarged forehead, a recessed hairline, almost. She has a broad jaw. She has a protruding chin. Yet she's considered to be one of the most beautiful women in the United States. As he spoke, these women's larger than life faces beamed from the projector screen behind him and on me. Um, we audience members were invited to see these women who we'd already seen countless times as people who had characteristics that might typically be considered masculine, but who were also undeniably beautiful. People are often attractive because they don't conform to statistical norms, Beck explained. Statistically, women have more pointed chins than men. This doesn't mean that pointed chins are prettier. It just means they're more common. Facial feminization surgery, he asserted, should not be used to normalize features that otherwise contribute to beauty. Masculine features, we learned, were not always manly ones, and they weren't always at odds then with a surgical approach to creating women that were distinctly beautiful rather than quantifiably female. Leanne visited Beck's office for an initial consultation. Her decision of whether or not to transition would depend on whether she thought she would pass when all was said and done. I'm a manager, she explained. I mean, that's what I do for a living but that's also who I am. I like to have everything figured out before I start. That's why I'm here, to manage my expectations. I need to know realistically where I might end up, instead of going forward with all of this and then finding out that you can't do what I think you can do. Given the face that I have, I want to know what to expect. Right now, I don't look like a woman. I look like a man in a wig. Beck sat motionless, letting her silences go unfilled. She talked about her anxieties, about whether her marriage would withstand her transition, about starting hormones, a thing she would put off until after her daughter's wedding, and about how she had chosen Beck because she didn't want all the classic female things. She wanted him to work with her features, not totally to make them. While Osterhout began patient examinations by immediately taking measurements of their face with a white plastic ruler he kept in his front coat pocket, Beck began by handing them a small mirror and asking them what they'd like to change about their faces. For Beck, FFS characterizes a particular set of desires more than a grouping of surgical procedures. For him, femininity is an effect of beauty rather than its origin. As such, he doesn't frame his work as enacting a change of the face's sex per se, but is interested instead in giving the patient the face that she wants. In this way, FFS is like all the other surgeries he performs. He responds to patients' feelings about their bodies more than the bodies themselves. Leanne sat looking at her reflection in the handheld mirror. Beck talked her through his recommendations, which included advancing her hairline, burning down the bossing of her eyes, reducing the dorsum and tip of her nose, and shortening her upper lip. In terms of the jaw, he said, I would leave it alone. Surprised by his recommendation, Leanne turned her face from her reflection and looked up at Beck standing up. <coughs> really? she asked. Beautiful women have a strong jawline, he explained. For you, cheek implants, possibly, to give you more fullness in the mid-face and nose, for sure. He also wanted to give her a brow lift and get rid of her crow's feet, because beauty, beauty, and beauty, beauty and youth are, of course, an inseparable pair. Doing this will give you the feminine appearance, he explained. It gives you sex appeal. That's the approach we're going for. The most important thing you can do between now and surgery, he explained, would be to start a skin care regimen. Beautiful women have beautiful skin. Leanne wasn't yet ready to make a decision about surgery. I'd live full time if I were possible, she told me, but I don't know if I can do it otherwise. If she couldn't reasonably expect to be, to pass as a woman, to be recognized as a woman in her everyday life, 
Leanne didn't know whether transitioning would be worth all that it would cost her. For her, transitioning only to look like a man in a wig didn't amount to transitioning at all. What would be the point of that? She asked her son. The overwhelming majority of people I met who had had FFS with Beck or with Osterhout were happy with their results. But this wasn't true for everyone. I offer one case of a patient whose FFS did not change her life in the way that she'd hoped to show how the question of woman, of who can know it, who can see it, and who can understand it, is never settled once and for all. Bodies unfold in time, and femininity, as all women know, is a receding horizon. Zoe had had a full face FFS with Dr. Osterhout nearly a year prior to our interview. She had, turned to re she had returned to the office to consult with him about a repair to her nose and the possibility of re-raising her upper lip, which sometimes can grow back down to its length. These would have to wait in any case because paying for FFS and genital surgery in the same year had left her on the verge of bankruptcy. Zoe had initially been pleased with the results of her FFS. Right after my surgery, I passed really well, she said. But lately, I've had some really upsetting experiences. A few weeks before our interview, armed guards pulled Zoe out of the airport security line in Dubai. The officers took her into a small room and asked her point blank if she was a man. I said no, she explained. He asked to see my passport, which says female, and he still didn't believe me. I thought, oh fuck, what do I do now? Suspecting that she was in fact male, the guard informed her that there was a penalty for lying about your gender in the United Arab Emirates. Eventually I told him he could see my vagina if he didn't believe me, and thank God I had one. That must have pushed him over the line because he just let me go. It was terrifying, she said, and she wiped tears from her eyes. Like all patients, when Zoe first came to consult about the possibility of FFS, her experiences of being read as trans were substantiated by the surgeon. With his white coat and white ruler, Osterhout externalized and reified her masculinity. After surgery, however, the knowledge produced by her experience of being red doesn't have the same value. Because for Osterhout, the certainty of the female face is total. The suggestion that a person could be read as male following a full face FFS makes no sense. How could anyone see a male face in one that's been metrically made female? Instead, he interpreted Zoe's experience in the airport as a result of her post-operative good looks. In his version of the events, the guards were not reading Zoe. They were leches who wanted to mess with a pretty girl. Harassment and objectification were simply aspects of being a beautiful woman to which no. Zoe had yet to adapt. More than that, the attention from these guards proved to Osterhout that Zoe's surgery had been a success. Any other, um, if she were not beautiful, the guards would not have bothered her. Any other interpretation of that event could only be explained as a kind of held over paranoia from all the preoperative years in which she really was being read as a trans woman. Or it could be that Zoe had failed to adequately support the sex of her new face through marshalling other appropriately gendered objects and behaviors. It's up to Zoe to pile on the gender signifiers, as it were, to support the fe her female face through learning to dress like, walk like, talk like, and otherwise affect women. While the preoperative fantasy is that the face will change everything, after surgery, the face can only do so much. Zoe's post-surgical symptoms, her experiences, were determined in Osterhout's exam to have no clinical basis. The two had reached a point of disagreement about what Zoe's face looked like, about whether or not she looked like a woman, and how such a question could be answered. But in the matter of surgical outcomes, their, their opinions don't hold equal authority. Zoe had become a problem patient, a category in which women and trans people often find themselves. Belgian FFS surgeon Dr. Bart Van de Van and colleagues caution surgeons to be aware of what makes their trans patients distinct and potentially problematic. They write, in most aesthetic operations, patients would like to improve their looks, but above all, continue to look like themselves. When it comes to facial feminization, patients wish to change dramatically. This means it's easy for patients to develop unrealistic expectations. Some even come with photos of other women that they would like to resemble. And as a side note, in my ethnographic experience, surgeons ask patients to come with those photographs. Um, so back to this. As a surgeon, it's very important to make clear to the patient that you'll do your best to make her look as feminine as possible, but you can't change her into another woman. I would argue, however, that changing her into another woman is precisely the promise of FFS. It's what Rachel hoped for and what Zoe mourned. Changing the patient from one woman whose status as a woman is hers alone to assert 
often in direct and painful contrast to the perceptions and attributions of others, into another woman, one whose status as a woman is reflected by and thus give, given iteratively by those around her, is exactly what Osterhout and Beck promised to do. At stake in all of these stories of FFS's scientific origins that would then be Rachel's intimate future, of Beck's promise of beauty through the exception that Caitlin and Brooke embraced and Lena struggled to see, and of Zoe's pained attempts to validate her experiences of being read following the reconstructive surgery that had cost her her life savings and so much more. At stake in all of these is the question of how forms of perception, argumentation, and technical practice can assert claims to know and create women. Beck and Osterhout are individual surgeons, but attending to the ways that they each define and build gender into their patients' faces is not an exercise in idiosyncrasy. Their technical work, unique as it is, opens onto a wider set of social, economic, and institutional <coughs> dynamics. Despite the stories they might like to tell about themselves, their work is not self-created and unique genius. It both reflects and helps to constitute the wider worlds of which they are a part. And this is a point that historians and ethnographers of surgery have made in a variety of contexts. Like Thomas Schlieff, for example, we know that gender is a malleable thing, and the means by which we each become recognizable both to ourselves and to others as an instance of some gendered subject are themselves subject to a host of shifting dynamics. Making faces into sexually dimorphic body parts requires a lot of work and ongoing argument, leaving the efficacy of FFS always open to question and contest. The processes of feminization and the femininity to which they are, it's aspire are constituted in both scientific and aesthetic discourses of FFS by their undesirable opposite, the masculine. The women I met who sought out FFS did so because to them, the form of their masculinity was absolutely certain, right? So why would a promise of femininity be any less certain? Their masculinity intruded and insisted itself in, everyday li in their everyday lives with very real consequences. So we got pulled out of the line. Part of what makes the surgical promise so of FFS so compelling is that masculinity coded in the biological discourse as maleness or in aesthetic discourses as homeliness or ugliness is materially present and visibly real. Procedures employed in the name of FFS respond to existing forms, hard jaw bones and jutting Adam's apples. Their removal both recalling a moment in the patient's prepubescent body and promising a future of self-actualization. So how does one think practically about medico-surgical enactments of sex change following the theoretical interventions in gender theory and theories of scientific knowledge that have developed alongside and in concert with transgender studies since the 1990s? To return to a commonly though differently deployed rubric, rubric of performativity, queer theory and science and technology studies have made my central questions in this project, what does a woman look like, and what kinds of knowledge can we use to support the claim to know, difficult to answer straight away. Instead, a performative framework pushes these questions into an infinite array of deferrals that answer not what woman or knowledge is, but how each is enacted. Their ontology is not set, but instead always being done. This approach doesn't ask whether there is or is not a distinct form of a woman's face, nor whether there is a fact of the human skeleton or some formula of beauty that legitimates FFS, but rather how a woman's face becomes a matter of fact in the practices and products, histories, and markets of FFS. One's as deeply enmeshed and raised and classed in understandings of recognizable womanhood as in personal and political understandings of health and health care. The deferral of truth questions into the everyday practices of their enactment is an analytic move particularly well suited to anthropological investigation. If it's the case that the body marks a material limit to the production of sex and of gender, then identifying the constitution of that limit is a distinctly anthropological problem. By this I mean that how the body is conceived and in what ways and situations it limits and enables particular sex gender attributions and assignments is a question that can't be addressed by general or abstract theorizations of gender, nor can it be shifted by political claims that material forms could or should signify otherwise. Instead, it's a particular um, and situated problem of lived practice and a problem to which ethnography must attend. More and more, FFS is being recognized as a critical component of medical transition for many trans women, targeting the increased bulk and squareness of the jaw, or skull, that occurs during puberty, FFS is by far the most invasive and expensive surgery aimed at altering the secondary sex characteristics. Parents and clinicians have used this fact 
to support early hormone intervention for trans-identified children and teenagers. Putting your kids on testosterone blockers when she's 11, the argument goes, will keep her out of the surgeon's office and away from the saw uh, 20 years down the road. Incidences of FFS is increasing in the United States and abroad, and supporters of its therapeutic efficacy are working to have it included among the trans-specific surgical interventions covered by a growing number of private and public health insurance providers here in the United States. My current research is focused on the shifting landscape of trans healthcare provision and what it means for prospective patients and the surgeons whose technical expertise is being demanded in new ways. Owing to recent advocacy work, insurance coverage for trans surgical procedures has increased exponentially in the past decade. The expansion of coverage suggests that people who may have been excluded by high out-of-pocket costs of surgical procedures will now use their insurance benefits to seek those services. At the moment, insurance providers are responding to their customers' requests for coverage in a variety of ways, including sometimes paying for patients to travel abroad to see specialists in other countries. Though future demand is difficult to predict for a number of reasons, it's safe to assume that if demand increases in proportion to the expansion of coverage, insurance providers' current case-by-case -case flexibility will give way to a more codified system of approval, both for patients and preferred surgeons. It's not at all clear, however, which surgeons might respond to an increasing patient population, nor how they would do so technically. There is no formal medical training in the U.S. for surgeons interested in developing this specialty. Those working in private practice take the occasional apprentice, but most fellowships are routed elsewhere in the world through university-based gender teams whose surgical work reflects very different systems of education, healthcare provision, and technical priority. In just a few weeks, I'll travel to Belgium where I'll spend a month at the Ghent University Hospital. A frequent host of surgical fellows and visitors from around the world, Ghent is a central node in the circulation of surgeons and of the techniques used to see and understand sex and to instantiate sex changes of many kinds. In the meantime, my research assistants and I have been working to create a database and literature review of nearly 200 genital surgery outcome studies from the last 30 years to look at how these papers conceptualize and evaluate surgical successes and surgical failures and to get a sense of when and how particular techniques and strategies get adopted and later cast aside. And I've been begun to collect oral and institutional histories of surgical provision in the United States. All of these efforts help to inform my ongoing ethnographic work with surgeons as I listen to what they say about bodies and watch what they do with their hands in order to remake them. When we talk about surgery in an abstract way, as an assumed stable act, as a longed-for ideal or a hackneyed foil, it's easy to forget that individual surgeons operate on individual people, and that the study of trans surgery is a study of people engaged in very personal projects of bodily transformation. Talking about surgery and being an ethnographer of its practice means attending to stories that span nations and to those unfolding within the infinite, intimate confines of individual lives. As Rachel and I sat talking in that back garden, she told me that she didn't really have a sense of what she would look like when the sutures were all removed and the bruises had all faded away. She'd done her homework, and she'd picked a surgeon, and deferred to his expertise to do the things that must be done. She didn't particularly care how she would look, as long as surgery worked. And if it did, she didn't particularly care how or why it did. There really was no way to know what might happen some Saturday morning when she walked into the grocery store and turned her face to the checkout clerk. No way to know what they would see or what they would say. All there was to do was sit. and a more and more common practice of our everyday life in the United States. Um, and so some of that literature 
does inform what I'm doing, um, with a really important caveat that while most of the literature on cosmetic surgery, including some of that stuff, is, is interested in changes in degree, right? From less beautiful to more beautiful, from less like this person to more like that person, from you know less young to more young. The difference in FFS and the claim that it makes is that it is a radical change in kind, right? And so I always have to think about that surgery and the questions that it asks and the kinds of claims it makes about its patients in relation to the very particular history of trans healthcare, and trans surgery, especially here in the U.S. as I'm working, to look at the way that those politics articulate together. Because if you, if there is one, uh, the, the only existing social science uh, writing on on this topic of FFS um, makes basically the argument through sort of a, the 1990s feminist uh, claims on cosmetic surgery that basically this is FFS is simply one more example of the way that women's bodies get pathologized and medicalized and problematized, and she frames that these surgeries as you know peddlers of snake oil, more or less, along that same line of critique. And I think what that misses is that there's a different claim being made here, and a claim that draws explicitly on the history of trans medical care and on a therapeutic logic that promises a kind of difference that those kinds of uh, interventions don't. So it's absolutely relevant, um, and I always try to work. To in the conversation with the others. Yes, the back. Um, about the moment that struck me was when Herlishka was brought in in a somewhat positive light. <laughs> um, is there any recognition among the folks using this sort of older phrenological work that this may, I mean, you said that they described this as an anthropological approach which certainly any, anybody in this room would suddenly just let their skin crawl. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought or recognition about any of that? No. Um, and that's been one of the things, you know, um, I never thought I would find myself working with her Lushka. I never thought I would be reading these kinds of texts and finding myself in bone rooms and, and reading on the early musical anthropology stuff. Um, the reason why it becomes a touchstone here, and, and the first article Oster Howe ever wrote on this subject, he said, um, before um, discriminant function analysis, there was this other way of doing it, which was about looking, right? And it, for him, it's just this one-off. But that that mark, right, where, where mathematical models and statistical models replace the, the, the subjective form of the viewer, is a big deal in the story of physical anthropology, and totally absent from this literature. And instead, of all the history that we all know about what makes this problematic and what makes what makes us want to put 77 asterisks after every single one of these claims is totally gone. And instead, the, the, the singular claim that emerges is there are two kinds of faces, anthropologists tell us so. And when you go back to look at the kinds of literature he was looking at, it was this moment. Uh, so, absolutely zero um, sort of recognition about what makes that complicated or why one would not necessarily want to state the claim. Um, 
sort of the fantasy of surgery itself, and that when you are a person who desires surgery, no matter like you have anything to do with this, right, or any other thing, if it could be anything, I would want to look great, right? I would want to look like a knockout. I would want to look like, you know, name the most beautiful person you can think of. That's the person I would like to be. Um, but certainly that gets tempered in a variety of different ways. There were some patients for whom beauty and prettiness were absolutely central to what they wanted, and some patients who said, I don't expect to be beautiful with me, right? Um, one patient said, like, if you come in with a face like a medicine ball, I expect to leave looking like Angelina Jolie. There's a problem, right? So different people related to the problem of what beauty might be. Um, in relationship to this sort of like increasing visibility of trans women, you, are, you absolutely hit it on those. It's a very particular kind of trans woman, like the kind that can be on the Neiman Marcus catalog. Um, and even from the very earliest moments of, of interventions, um, Harry Benjamin, the, 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 the father of transgender medicine, um, in an early paper in the 1950s said, you know, for patients who come in who don't look like Christine Jorgensen, right, who was sort of the very glamorous, um, the sort of the icon of the American transsexual for years and years and remains to be so, he said, for people who don't look like Christine Jorgensen, they're gonna have a problem later on, right? And so there's a very particular celebration of, of the trans woman as a beauty queen um, that is increasing, so there's an increasing ability of that figure, which makes life for people whose bodies do not adhere to that norm seems even more suspect, mm -hmm. right? So there's a back and forth. Thank you for a wonderful talk and maybe a slight follow-up question. Could you talk about the racial logics that are also at play in these kinds of surgeries and ideas of aesthetic beauty? Absolutely, that's a, a big part of the story that um, a, a book manuscript based on this um, engages with that a lot. So um, the forms, the, these uh, forms that I was talking about, either through the, the, the skull collection or the sort of and certainly the atlas that's based on all white people. Um, the, just, in just the same way that the problematic nature of the early physical anthropology gets swallowed and made invisible in this discourse, so does racial difference. So racial difference emerges as though there are two. And then racial di racialness, race as a category, gets layered on top of that. So there are two forms, and then there's a, the Asian form of the female face, and then there's the black form of the female face, and then there's, right? But any time I've ever seen illustrations or photographs in surgical uh, literature or on surgeons' websites of forms that are meant to demonstrate sexual dimorphism, the person is always a Caucasian person. Um, and so that is the invisible, <coughs> unmarked norm that, that motivates all of this stuff. Um, in my fieldwork, I only saw two people of color um, as patients in Osterhout's office, um, and there was a question on how to respond to their ethnicity. And, and in general, the claim that I make in the book and what I see uh, throughout this practice is that ethnicity and masculinity get put together both as problems of excess, right? So there's too much nose, or there's too wide of eyes, or there's too, the, the Asian jaw is too square. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that ethnicity and masculinity get mapped onto each other as imagined excesses of skeletal and soft tissue forms on top of what is implicitly a white female norm underneath all of us. And that if we could just recuperate that original body that we all had as kids before our differences emerged, then it's all there, right? And in a lot of ways that, in some, so I think some people it renders this sort of um, man trapped in a woman's body metaphor in quite a literal way. Um, and, and the doctors address this difference in, in a variety of different forms, some of which naming genes as the site of difference, um, but always um, whiteness is the implicit and unmarked norm that Thank mm -hmm. you.
So what we were, had been talking about before is that one of the things that surgeons worry about um, and is that they will have done all the traumatic stuff, but that when a patient wakes up and is super swollen and, and for a variety of different reasons, they won't to themselves look that different. And they will therefore be disappointed by the fact that they not only put all this money and pain into it, but were promised a kind of radical transformation that they don't see. <coughs> And so one of the ways that surgeons deal with this problem is by taking pre-operative photographs that they then make sure that the patient sees. And they'll say sometimes, um, if you go where your friend, your friend says, you don't look that different to me, you show him this picture, right? Like, there's a way to, to do this. Um, so it's the idea being that your, your brain, in this, this theory, will adapt itself to see you no matter what you look like, because that's what your brain does. It makes you see yourself no matter how you look. So they try to remedy this by having the before and after photo as a feature, as a part of the narrative of the transformation itself. Um, the question of passing is an interesting one. So the, um, I met with many people who thought FFS was a terrible thing. It's a terrible idea. Um, these guys are jackasses, these surgeons, who make trans women feel inadequate, who um, have only further medicalized and pathologized just a new part of the body and made it available for um, profit making, and that these guys, that nobody needs FFS, what we need is to change the way people understand gender in our country, what we need is to make more kinds of bodies available, um, to be okay bodies, what we need right this, this, this political project, um, and the, the really dangerous underside to that um, critique, which I think makes total sense in many ways, is the danger of then characterizing the trans women who choose to undergo the surgery in the same negative way that they were once mischaracterized by the 1970s, 1980s feminism, right? Which is to say, they don't get it. And here they are subjecting themselves to a surgical fix that only reinforces the problem that they're trying to solve, right? And I am very, very aware of that critique, and I don't like the slippery slope that starts by saying, these guys are bad, and implicitly what happens to the patients then, or the patients who choose to use these services are also bad in these politically retrograde sorts of ways. So I'm very allergic to that discourse, and I'm trying to track the ways that certain kinds of medical interventions for trans folks are seen as a political good, and other kinds get vilified as being part of, a, of an anti-trans or an anti-liberatory politics. Um, and I think because FFS is uh, ex it's explicitly about perceptions of other people, it's particularly a site where some of that stuff is getting worked out. So I'm trying right, to so one of my questions was then, well, how is the self-perception and the inability of the self-perception to change? Like, how is that a factor, or is it a factor, in people's experiences of their ability to pass or not? Sort of like setting aside, you know what I mean? Like, like sure. setting, or, setting aside the sort of the political context of, of you know, condemnation or not. But I just thought that that observation about what can make a surgery, a surgery fail mm -hmm. in terms of the brain's capacity to make your new face be still you um, just made me think about that, uh, that question of passing in terms of how much, I mean, I suppose it's not unlike Osterhout's interpretation of Zoe's story at the airport. I mean, that is your failure to pass, your own failure to understand your new face. Right, and that becomes a site of this increased anxiety. So, I mean, each of the surgeons who are involved in different specialties work on different parts of the body. And part of what each of them say is, this is the one, right? And if that doesn't work, then the next question is, what's the thing, right? If, if the story of passing is a story of, a story of indexing the body's characteristics, and changing one didn't work, what would the next thing be, right? So, among people, um, you know, I would talk to, I would say, hey, you know, what do you think about FFS? And they would say, FFS, look at me, I'm 6'3". What do I care about FFS, right? Or someone else would go, FFS, what do I care? Look at me, I have like arms like a linebacker, right? So people would, in, would choose their, the index of their body that mattered. Like, what was the thing? And for some people, they felt sure that the face was the thing. And when it wasn't the thing, then it was really hard, right? I mean, it's really hard because it, you build for yourself this idea that you figured it out, right? You figured it out, and it's scientific, and there's no question, and it's gonna work, and you put all of your money into this, right? People I met who had been saving their money for 15 years. And so to turn around and say, 
maybe or maybe not, right? Like the stakes are really, really high in that. And so part of the attention is like, what is the surgical narrative that animates that activity? And how are the, how can we be attentive to what the surgeons are doing technically in order to respond to that promise, which is much bigger than what happens in the OR, right? It's much bigger. Yeah. Yes. So I was really fascinated by your story of the of the person who was taken aside and confronted for being uh, not really a woman. Yeah. And I think what I wanted to know was when the surgeon, I think first of all, these surgeries are a fantastic, um, a fantastic racket that can avoid all kinds of blames on the outcome, right? Because if it, you know, it's not the surgery, it's that you didn't embody or implement the femininity adequately. So I wanted to ask you how do, what kind of meta-narratives that doctors put out to patients about how to implement this new femininity, uh, especially with regard to, uh, what do they call this, vocal feminization? Uh, like changes in pitch and um, voice quality that I know um, also occur, as well as what other semiotic things get recruited into this. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, surgeons deal with this problem very differently. Um, some of them have, uh, or they recommend femininity coding. Uh, and there are people who make their living uh, trying to train other people how to do gender better. And these are like very middle class, very white ideas about what gender are, you know, like how to sit down in a nice car in a short skirt, right? Like how to hold roses. I mean, like, so sort of the absurdity of it can be really uh, intense. Um, but so sometimes there is this notion that you can, um, that femininity or masculinity is everywhere, and it's everything that you do, and if you want to do it right, you got to like, work on all of this other stuff. But that has to be balanced with a surgical narrative of redemption. Right? So if the surgeon says it's everything, well then, what's the surgery? Um, you know, so there is a back, there's a, a sort of a fine line back and forth, and what, you know, um, as I said, I think the, narr the pre-surgery narrative is that surgery is the thing. And the post-surgery narrative, if things, if things didn't go well, is you might want to try talking to somebody about vocal training. You might want to try, right? But, but that's not something that the surgeon would say because that's something that the surgeon's staff would say, right? To try to ameliorate some of the stress that patients are feeling. Um, so it, it varies quite a bit, but again, like the, sur the surgical story has to be uh, an omnipotent story. Um, and it, so pre-surgically it is. Maybe a last question? Yeah, I'm running really so, well. Given uh, the state of the art of uh, computer imagery, yes. Yes. where somebody can look into a computer, change different ratios and proportions before they have an operation, how much does this fit into the process of either becoming or making a choice in terms of a sense of agency in itself? Or becoming socialized to what you will look like in the future when you prepare them, or prepare them. How does this computer do what you see as the future? Yeah, so um, I was talking about doesn't use computer imaging. Um, I Some patients were very compelled by the images that they saw, and other patients were really disappointed by the images that they saw. And it did a lot to sort of temper people's expectation of what they could do. Um, and uh, sometimes they were, like I said, sometimes they were very disappointed. Um, so that plays a part in some surgeons' practice um, more so than others. There are certainly things, there are a lot of things about the proportionality uh, that's involved in FFS that doesn't render well in computer imaging. So you can see differences here, but you can't see the holistic effect. So it's somewhat limited. Um, a lot of people uh, seek um, second opinions through an online service where you can submit photos of yourself to a woman in the UK who will digitally alter them, make certain recommendations, you know, uh, surgeon, make recommendations on what surgery you should have and send it back to you. And people use that as a consult 
So they'll do the first con they'll do that with her first because it's cheap and pretty fast. They'll look at the pictures and go, I think it's worth it. And then they'll go to the surgeons and find out if the surgeon made the same recommendations that the virtual FFS person that did. And if they did, then if, if the surgeon does, then they take that as corroboration that those are, are actually. Do you see this as a as a market in the future, given how much cost is involved here? actually being able to get a consult and compare with different surgeons before they do the surgery. Yes, and some people do that. So one of the big uh, ways that people who specialize in trans medicine and uh, surgery run their business is that there are these national conventions, seven or eight of them around the country, these surgeons go to them, and they set up uh, sort of makeshift consultation rooms in their hotel rooms, and people sign up for a 15 minute slot, and you can go in and get a quick and so patients will go around and see all these people at one time and get a sense from each one what they would do, what it would cost, a sense of how nice they are, how they were treated, when they could schedule them, and then they kind of sit with all of that. Because otherwise, you end up flying yourself around the whole country. It's very expensive, but these, these conferences allow these, all this stuff to work. And surgeons build 30% of their annual revenue um, at these conferences where they're finding and, and getting face-to-face -face time with people. Um, so it absolutely is. Uh, comparison shopping. But you know, when you're if you're choosing between Beck and Oster how you're not choosing on on what you think the result is going to be. Right? You're choosing on what what their vision of the thing that you need is. And the person who you choose is the person who makes the most compelling argument to you about what it is that you need. And that's what's at stake, right, in the certain stylistic differences is here's what you need with the face you've got in order for that person to have the grocery store to call. Yes, Say more about the relationship you're seeing between the early travel intervention, early transition, hormone blocker discourse, and you know, that, that, that that's increasing, as well as patient immunization surgery increasing the tension between those and the way they get paid off things together. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that I think is very interesting to see about the growth of FFS is that FFS engages a different logic of what bodily sex is than gender sex raising surgery. Right. So it's a recognition that sex isn't something that you are when you make it. It's something that you are every day and has an effect of being living in social life. Right? So it's shifting the conversation about what kinds of things one should intervene in order to change sex. Um, because it's such a radical intervention and, and parents of trans kids don't want their kids to have this experience, FFS becomes a really powerful lever in that to say, if your kid was born with the genital anatomy that they were born with, but their face is going to change in a really intense way, and if you, early, if you do early hormone intervention, you can prevent that from happening. So the, the invasiveness of FFS is what makes it such a compelling lever for all of that. But, you know, absolutely there are more and more um, parents, more and more advocacy organizations, more and more physicians who are um, arguing that early hormone intervention is the best possible um, thing to do for where it's like the it's like it's like oh no no we have to do surgery we have to do it really quickly you know it's like we can manage everything else we've got to do the surgery and the kids as yeah. early as possible versus the idea of avoiding surgery at all costs for these, these other kids. Well and most of what that the early hormone intervention argument is is not that it, you're gonna do, it, it's that you're gonna give them enough time to make a decision. Ostensibly a better decision. Right? If you can just forestall these secondary sex characteristics then they might change their mind. And then we won't have to go out and put it at all. Right? Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a wait. We're gonna wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and see how far we can push this all down the road. And a lot of the issue with that is that there's really no good endocrinological work being done on this at all. And the fantasy that sort of animates all of it is that sex sex hormones only make secondary sex characteristics that's the only thing they do to bodies, right? And I think that's potentially a very problematic way of organizing what the what the issues are. That's Mostly it's been like, keep your kid out of the doctor's office. We can do it together. Yeah. We're gonna have to go no, because there's a class coming into this room, but thank you. Um, if you're in the